Hi, I'm Arnie Gunderson from Fairwinds. Today, I'd like to talk to you about the relationship between the people who own nuclear reactors and the people who regulate nuclear reactors. Not just in the United States, not just in Japan, but worldwide. What made me think of this topic was an um, opinion piece in the New York Times just last week. The opinion piece was written by a Southern California professor, University of Southern California, and um, he specializes in studying how countries regulate nuclear power. In it, he says that the Fukushima accident was, and this is a quote, the result of failures in the safety culture. Japan's Nuclear Regulatory Agency, for instance, was never really independent of the nuclear industry. The plant's operator, Tokyo Electric Power had a long history of disregarding safety concerns and a woefully weak safety culture that was allowed to operate with minimal government oversight. Well, he goes on to suggest that the solution for this problem is, quote, what we need now are much closer cooperation between countries and their regulators. Well, I disagree with what that University of Southern California professor suggests. We don't need closer cooperation between countries. What we need to do is to enforce the safety standards that we already have. Blaming Fukushima on a cozy relationship between Tokyo Electric Power and the Japanese government is wrong. It implies that other countries are doing it better. And that's not true, and that's really what I'd like to talk about in this, visit, in this video. The fuse for Fukushima was, was lit 45 years ago, when Fukushima 1 was built by an American company and an American architect engineer using an American design. To claim that the problem with Fukushima is a cozy relationship between the Japanese regulator and, and the, uh, the people at Tokyo Electric is really disingenuous. And it gives the entire nuclear industry a shield to hide behind. Until 1974, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission was regulated by something called the Atomic Energy Commission. Now, the Atomic Energy Commission, or the AEC, had a charter, and it was to promote and to regulate. Now Congress realized that that wasn't working. And what they did was they split the Nuclear Regulatory Com they split the Atomic Energy Commission into the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and the Department of Energy. The theory was that the Department of Energy would promote and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission would regulate. But what really happened was that the team stayed the same, and all they did was change the name on their jerseys. Well, in 1974, Congress recognized that things were too cozy. So let's fast forward into the 80s and see if things had changed. On the site is a report from 1970, 1987, and it's entitled, NRC Coziness with Industry. That's not my name for it. That's the Congressional Report's name, the NRC's Coziness with Industry. And it's written by the um, Committee on Insular, Interior and Insular Affairs um, of the United States Congress. It's long, it's 100 pages, and it's typed, so it's scanned in. But I thought I'd read three of the highlights to you. The first highlight is that the congressional staff and, and Congress people discovered that, quote, the NRC staff interfered with and undermined an investigation of a licensee's wrongdoing at the Fermi plant in Michigan. The second issue they discovered is that a nuclear regulatory commissioner, one of the five appointed commissioners, quote, engaged in behavior that constitutes malfeasance and reflects a continuing closeness with the nuclear industry. This is 1987. And the last one I'd like to call to your attention is that they found, despite the fact of an adequate administrative record demonstrating that a problem was in need of a solution, the commission issued a rule severely restricting the ability of its own staff 
to require safety improvements at existing nuclear facilities. So let's jump forward one more decade here and we'll go to the 1990s. In the 1990s, the Inspector General for the Nuclear Regulatory Commission was a man named David Williams. He wrote a letter to the commissioner saying that the problem with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission was that they listened to the people who own the nuclear power plants and not to the people who have legitimate concerns. His exact words was, was that the NRC, quote, relies on the assurances of licensees. Now, I was part of that report. I brought some safety concerns forward to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission uh, and they were ignored. And in the process, uh, it discovered a very cozy relationship between the regulator and the people that they were attempting to regulate. It went to congressional hearings with, with John Glenn and in the congressional hearings, the chairman of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission said this, it is true. Everything Mr. Gunderson said was absolutely right. He performed quite a service. Nothing changed after that hearing. What he said to Congress had no effect on the way the agency was behaving. Well, let's fast forward another decade and start at the beginning of the 21st century. There's an excellent um, journalism piece out and it's in the Austin Chronicle. It's investigative journalism at its very best. And it's called, Will Shill for Nukes? And the, the author of it discovered that a industry group, the NEI, the Industry Trade Organization, was writing opinion pieces. And they were then giving those opinion pieces to professors around the country and asking those professors of nuclear power, nuclear engineering at universities around the country, they were asking the professors to put those in the local newspapers. Well, quite a few professors obliged. So opinion pieces were written by the nuclear industry were given to university professors and put with the university professor's name into, um, into editorials in local newspapers touting the benefits of nuclear power. Now what makes this really interesting is that one of the university professors that's mentioned in the story is a, is a man named Dale Klein. Mr. Klein became the chairman of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission one year after that investigative journalism report was issued. Well, as a final one, let's look at just two years ago. The NRC's Inspector General wrote a, um, wrote a report about one of the NRC's commissioners. This gentleman's name is Jeffrey Merrifield. Now, Commissioner Merrifield was determined to have been looking for a job in the nuclear industry while he was a commissioner. He was calling the people he regulated and asking them for work. Not only that, he found work. And for his last couple months on the job, he was making decisions that were favorable to the person who was going to employ him at a million dollars a year once he left the NRC. Well, that report is also on our site and, uh, and it makes for interesting reading. Well, today, things really haven't changed. Just last month, there was a meeting with the uh, International Atomic Agent Energy Agency and they, um, they had it in private. In that meeting were industry executives and heads of government that a serious accident happened in Japan is not a statement about the Japanese culture. Rather, it speaks to the pressure that the nuclear industry exerts on nations worldwide. It can happen in your country. Thank you.